Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, hope you're doing all right. Hope you're staying safe and healthy. Uh, today, for our daily devotion, we are going to turn to Acts chapter 20, and then also uh, Jeremiah chapters 30, uh, 36 through 37, excuse me, through 39 uh, is going to be our focus for today. So if you want, grab your Bible and turn with me there. You know, how do you, let me start with a question. How do you say goodbye? How do you handle uh, goodbyes? You know, I think there's really uh, three patterns that I tend to see or tend to recognize. Uh, it's the number one being the quick and easy, right? Um, I'm not sure if these people uh, don't have a soul or they're just trying to avoid the pain of saying goodbye, but they rush through it, right? Uh, they try to get away from saying goodbye and move on as quickly as they can. Uh, that's option one. Option two is... Uh, really kind of the awkward fumble, right? Uh, you see this a whole lot. It's the, it's the half hug. It's the, uh, the quick handshake. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe a quick kiss and, uh, uh, a quick I love you. And honestly, it kind of feels like, uh, they don't know what they're doing. Um, it seems kind of half hearted almost at times. And, uh, it can be a little awkward. Uh, so the awkward fumble is number two. And then there's the uh, slobbery, lingering mess or um, what some people might call the Midwest goodbye, right? Uh, this is the long, drawn out. We spend 20 minutes uh, at the kitchen counter saying goodbye. Uh, we move to the door and we spend another 10 minutes there. Uh, we finally get out to the garage and to the car and it's another 10 minutes there, and it's this long, drawn-out, lingering, uh, sobbing mess. There's oftentimes lots of tears, especially if it's going to be uh, for a significant period of time. Um, there tends to be lots of hugs, uh, and, you know, depending on who you are, uh, this can be rather uncomfortable. Uh, it can be it can be uncomfortable. It's best to avoid these kind of long, drawn-out, lingering goodbyes, depending on the situation and, and how you feel. Um, but how do you say goodbye? You know, let me know in the comments below uh, which you tend to fill in, fit in best. Are you are you a quick uh, quick goodbye person? Are you kind of the awkward half? Hearted goodbye, or are you the sobbing, lingering mess? You know, if you ask anyone, <clears throat> um, I tend to have a little bit of a soft heart. Um, for those of you who know me, uh, I tend to show emotion. That's just who I am. Um, that's part of the way I don't know. It's just part of who I am. But anyways, uh, you know, there's a story here in Acts chapter 20 in our text today that kind of is that long, lingering, sobbing goodbye. You know, uh, I, I got to confess that it's it's a little uncomfortable for me to read Acts chapter 20. Uh, you know, um, it's one thing to say goodbye and have that long, lingering, kind of sobbing mess goodbye with family. Uh, but here Paul is with some elders in the church in Ephesians chapter 20, and he is going to end up, say, he's drawn them together, he's going to say goodbye to them, he's going to go to Jerusalem, and uh, it's kind of this awkward, uncomfortable picture. These are not family members. Uh, he's spent a good deal of time with them. I'm sure he's developed some relationships with them, but even with the people that I've been uh, close to in life, uh, some of my good friends, uh, you would never catch me doing what happens here. And so Paul gathers them together in there. Uh, he's saying goodbye. He's telling them what's going to happen. Take a look at verse uh, 22, uh, starting at verse 22. And now behold, I am going to Jerusalem constrained by the Spirit not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me that in every city, imprisonment and afflictions 
await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. This is what Paul has been all about. This is what his ministry has been all about. And now Paul gathers together these Ephesian disciples, these uh, elders of the church, these leaders, and he says, hey, I'm leaving and I don't know that I'm going to return. Uh, in fact, uh, the Holy Spirit tells me that uh, I probably am not going to come back. You're probably not going to see me alive again. And he continues to expound upon this. He warns them uh, to stay away from false teachers. Um, and all of this uh, kind of moving thing is he wraps up his ministry in Ephesians. And then we get to the end. Um, we get to the end of chapter 20. Um, and here's what it says. And when he said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. Now, this is a little different, uh, in kind of first century Jewish context. The typical, uh, stance of prayer would have been to stand. Uh, to kneel was kind of a humbling, um, it was kind of a, a time of emotion, uh, that would have been common there. Uh, emotional times, but he kneels with them and he prays with them. And there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because of the word that he had spoken, that they would not see his face again. And they accompanied to him to the ship. You know, I can think of the times where uh, I've had to say goodbye to uh, friends, um, people that uh, I've grown to love and care about. Um, you know, I can think of saying goodbye to friends in college or uh, when I was in seminary. And yeah, you give a half-hearted hug and, and you say goodbye and, hey, we'll keep in contact. And, uh, you know, it's it's not half-hearted. It's there. Uh, but it's kind of this awkward thing. And to have this big emotional mess uh, seems a little awkward to me. But yet, it's kind of a cool thing. Uh, Paul has lived among these people. He's preached the gospel with them. Uh, he loves them with all of his heart. Uh, they love him. And to hear that, that chances are he's not coming back, uh, is, it, it hurts. It hurts them. Um, you know, and I think nowadays, uh, we've been kind of separated now for almost a month. Um, and man, you know, it would be great to see some people and to be able to give hugs or uh, to be able to uh, just show you care, right? Um, that's one thing that I'm finding that I miss is the social interaction with people. Uh, being able to be there and support and care for people, um, to give them a hug and say, you know what, it's okay. Uh, it's okay that you're you're struggling right now. It's okay that... Uh, whatever the situation is, uh, God's with you. Um, and to kind of be there to support in a caring way. Um, and it, it kind of, it kind of hurts. It's different. I don't know if you feel the same way. Maybe you're a introverted person and, and you can't relate at all. Uh, but as a pastor, uh, that's just part of who I am. It's kind of empathy and caring and support. And a lot of times you do that with a hug or with a, a half hug or, or, you know, just a, a, a hand on the shoulder to say, it's okay. Um, and I miss being able to do that with people. I miss being able to, to care for them and to be there with the comforting word of God and to say, he's with you, even in this. Um, but we still have the gift of technology, right? Um, to look on the positive side, and this is where I've kind of tried to uh, shift my view to more of an optimistic tone as we go through this. Uh, it's easy to stay kind of in the dumps. It's easy to look at the, the negatives and all the um, bad things that are happening right now and to dwell on those emotions of not being able to be with people and to uh, feeling kind of sorrowful and down in the dumps. Uh, it's easy to dwell on there. And so I've tried to, tried to keep my eyes fixed on the positive. Uh, through the gift of technology, we're still able to call, 
we're still able to to talk with one another and and encourage one another. And so here's my question for you today. Who do you need to call? Who do you know that could use some encouragement today? Uh, who do you know could use a pickup? Uh, and uh, think about that for a moment. And uh, let me encourage you, uh, reach out to them. Uh, pick someone up, uh, share with them the comfort, the peace, the joy that we have in Jesus. Uh, do that. Uh, it may feel a little awkward. Uh, it may feel a little uncomfortable. Yes. Uh, but you won't regret it. And so find a way to encourage someone today. You know, in moving on to our uh, Old Testament uh, portion today, uh, Jeremiah chapters 37 through 39, you know, despite all of the warnings from God and Jeremiah's best, best efforts to call the people of Jerusalem to repentance, uh, the day of judgment has finally come, right? The armies of Babylon, after briefly breaking off their siege, uh, they leave, they're, they're fighting in Jerusalem, right? They're trying to break into Jerusalem uh, to destroy the city. Uh, and for a short time, they end up in a battle with Egypt. And so the armies that are around Jerusalem, uh, they leave, they go, they take care of that fight, and they come back. And they come back to finish the job. And Jeremiah is captured by some of these officials uh, who detest the word. And what happens to him? They throw him in prison. Take a look at Jeremiah chapter 37, verse 15. Uh, and the officials were enraged at Jeremiah, and they beat him and imprisoned him in the house of Jonathan, the secretary, for it had been made a prison. And so uh, this may seem harsh. This may seem... Uh, <clears throat> devastating, if you will, but really, uh, in an act of mercy, King Zedekiah moves him out of the dungeon um, where Jeremiah would uh, feared he was going to die. Take a look at verse 20. Now here, please, O my Lord, the king, let my humble plea come before you, and do not send me back to the house of Jonathan, Jonathan the secretary, lest I die there. Jo uh, Jeremiah is worried uh, that he's going to lose his life. And so King Zedekiah moves him to the court of the guard where he's going to remain until Jerusalem falls. And yet even there, Jeremiah, um, he may have feared for his life while he was in the house of Jonathan. Uh, but even there, uh, once he's moved to the court of the guard, Jeremiah wasn't safe. And, you know, Some of those same officials, they conspired against him to have him killed and, and thrown into an empty cistern, an empty uh, watering hole, if you will. <clears throat> Take a look at verses, uh, chapter 38, verses 1 through 6. Now, Sheptiah the son of Matan, Gedadiah the son of Pashur, Jukal the son of she Shemelah, and Pashur the son of Makalah heard the words that Jeremiah was saying to all the people. Thus says the Lord, he who stays in the city shall die by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence. But he who goes out to the Chaldeans shall live. He shall have his life as a prize of war and life. Thus says the Lord, this city shall surely be given into the hand of the army of the king of Babylon and be taken. Then the officials said to the king, let this man be put to death, for he is weakening the hands of the soldiers who are left in the city and the hands of all the people by speaking such words to them, right? This is critical, uh, kind of a critical warning that Jeremiah is delivering. Hey, you're better off surrendering. You're going to walk away with your life than to sit and try to fight. Because if you sit and fight, eventually Babylon's army is going to break in and you're going to die. And these officials hear these words and they say, look, Jeremiah is... Um, He's uh, bringing down the morale of our troops. Like, this guy's not, uh, we can't let him continue to to speak uh, because he's discouraging people. And so here's their, here's what their thought is. Um, they said, uh, let this man be put to death for he is weakening the hands of the soldiers who are left in the city in the hands of all the people by speaking such words to them. For this man is not seeking the welfare of this people, but their harm. King Zedekiah said, Behold, he is in your hands. 
for the king can do nothing against you. So they took Jeremiah and cast him into the cistern of Makalah, the king's son, which was in the court of the guard, letting Jeremiah down by ropes. And there was no water in the cistern, but only mud. And Jeremiah sank into the mud. Uh, so Jeremiah is in this empty watering hole, if you will. Uh, but here's what happens to him. They mean this to do harm to him. Uh, but the text goes on a little further. Uh, take a look at chapter 38, verses 11 through 13. So Ebed Mechel took the men with him and went to the house of the king to a wardrobe in the storehouse and took from there old rags and worn out clothes, which he let down to Jeremiah in the cistern by ropes. Then Ebed Mecca, the Ethiopian, said to Jeremiah, Put the rags and clothes between your armpits and the ropes. Jeremiah did so. Then they drew Jeremiah with uh, drew, drew Jeremiah up with ropes and lifted him out of the cistern, and Jer- Jeremiah remained in the court of the guard. You see, as a reward for his faithfulness, Jeremiah and his servant were both spared uh, when Jerusalem is restored. He had done his job. He had served his purpose. Uh, these officials mean for him to die in this cistern, whether it's to starve to death or eventually uh, sink into the mud and eventually drown. Uh, if it were to rain, that was a possibility. Uh, but his life is spared. Uh, take a look at chapter 39, verses 11 through 18. And here's here's where we see this. Nebuchadnezzar, king of the Babylon, uh, king of Babylon, gave command concerning Jeremiah through Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Nebuchadnezzar Dan, the captain of the guard. Pretty similar name. Sorry. Take him, look after him well, and do him no harm, but deal with him as he tells you. So Neba, Neba, Neba Rezdan, the captain of the guard, Nebashan, the Rezabe, uh, Nagar Sar Ezer and Reg, uh, Rab Meg and all the chief officials of the court of Babylon sent and took Jeremiah from the court of the guard. They entrusted him to Gedalah, the son of Akalam, son of Shepa, that he, Shapan, sorry, son of Shapan, that he should take him home. So he lived among the people. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah while he was up in the court of the guard. Go, said Say to Ebed Mecca the Ethiopian, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will fulfill my word against this city for harm and not for good, and they shall be accomplished before you on that day. But I will deliver you on that day, declares the Lord, and you shall not be given in the hands of the men of whom you are afraid. For I will surely save you and shall not uh, fall, and you shall not fall by the sword, but you shall have your life as a prize of war. Because you have put your trust in me, declares the Lord. You see, God promises to protect those who are faithful. Uh, yes, we may go through tough times in life. Uh, we may go through difficult situations. For some of us uh, right now, we are in one of those situations. Um, it can seem daunting. It can seem overwhelming. Uh, but God promises to save those who are faithful. And where do we see that? Uh, we see that in the cross. Uh, we see that in God's promise that those who put their faith and their trust in Jesus, that they will receive eternal life. Uh, we see that in those who run the race well will receive the crown of everlasting life. And what a wonderful promise that is for those who have faith, uh, that God promises that he's with us and that we will receive the reward uh, for staying faithful in the midst of all of this in the midst of life, in the midst of the chaos of this world. Uh, God is with us. And so uh, what great promises that we have. Uh, and we know that he will keep those promises. Why? Uh, because we've seen him keep his promises in the past. He fulfills all of the Old Testament prophecies in Jesus. Uh, he sends his son to die for us on the cross. Uh, there we find forgiveness of sins. We find uh, the hope of of um reconciliation with God, and we hear the promise of Jesus after he's risen from the dead, that those who put their hope and trust in him will receive that joy, that reward, the gift of eternal life. 
And so continue to cling to that promise, continue to cling uh, to the words of God, uh, continue to cling to to God's word, uh, spending time in prayer uh, and enjoying the, the truth that you and I have the wonderful promise of everlasting life. And we know it's true because Jesus is alive. God's blessings to you. Uh, hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. God bless.